What do you have to say about dictators of countries like Indonesia, who we sell weapons to, yet they are slaughtering people in East Timor? What do you have to say about Israel, who is slaughtering Palestinians, who impose martial law? What do you have to say about that? Those are our allies. Why do we sell weapons to these countries? Why do we support them? Why do we bomb Iraq when it commits similar problems? There are various examples of things that are not right in this world, and the United States is trying... <laughs> I uh, really am surprised that people feel that it is necessary to defend the rights of Saddam Hussein, when what we ought to be thinking about is how to make sure that he does not use weapons of mass destruction. I'd like to... I'd like shouting. To make it Just a moment. I'm not defending him in the least. What I am saying is that there needs to be consistent application of U.S. foreign policy. We cannot support people who are committing the same violations because they are political allies. That is not acceptable. We cannot via violate U.N. resolutions when it is convenient to us. We You're not, not answering my question, answer. Madam Albright. Uh, the press, did you not, when you were there? Well, I had several jobs. One of my jobs was that of analyst. Uh, I also was an interrogator and indeed briefed the press when we, the CIA, wanted to uh, circulate disinformation on a particular issue. Disinformation is not necessarily, uh, not necessarily a lie. It may be a half-truth. And uh, we would pick out a journalist. I would go do the briefing and uh, hope that he would put the information in print. What was your percentage of success? We were pretty successful in planning uh, information of a rather rarefied nature. For instance, uh, if we wanted to get uh, across to the American public that the North Vietnamese were building up their force structure in South Vietnam, I would go to a journalist and advise him that in the past uh, six months, X number of North Vietnamese forces had come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail system through southern Laos. Now, there is no way a journalist can check that information. Uh, that's data derived from uh, uh, radio intercepts, uh, spy in the uh, sky photography. So either he goes with the information or he doesn't, and ordinarily or usually, the journalist would go with it because it, was, it looked like some kind of exclusive uh, go after these gentlemen. Uh, I would uh, be directed to cultivate them, to spend time with them at uh, the Caravelle Hotel or the Continental Hotel, to socialize with them, and, and slowly but surely to try to gain their confidence by dolloping out uh, valid information, information which was true. And then I would drop in a, into a conversation the data that we wanted to get across which might not be true. Uh, one piece of data, for instance, uh, that uh, we managed to plan in the New Yorker magazine had to do with uh, a supposed North Vietnamese effort in 1973 to develop airfields along the border of South Vietnam. The reason we wanted to plant this information was that uh, we were trying to persuade the U.S. Congress that Saigon should uh, be continued to, should continue to get a great deal of aid. Uh, and that uh, the North Vietnamese were the chief violators of the ceasefire accord. That was printed in uh, the New Yorker magazine under the byline of Robert Chaplin, as indeed was a great deal of such information which, uh, which we tried to circulate. Frank, a, a two-part question. What, what were the objectives of the, or what was the objective of the CIA what about the moral implications of what you were doing in feeding this information? Did the objective override the moral implications, moral problems? Well, the objective of the agency in general is to generate intelligence and get it back to Washington, to, to get at the truth and make sure the policymakers understand it. When you pl plant disinformation, you are diverging from that objective, and I think probably in retrospect, 
it was uh, very counterproductive. I am, as an ex-CI agent, uh, opposed to the disinformation activities uh, in which I was involved. I admit that I was involved, and I think it uh, uh, served no useful purpose. Uh, propagandizing the American uh, public or Congress is not the CIA's job. Uh, as to the morality of what the CIA was doing or that particular uh, activity, uh, the war was a very relative thing. It was a relativistic environment, and uh, morality seldom came into play when uh, you were operating in the field. Uh, in my estimation, a CIA man should be amoral. Uh, that may sound pretty shocking to somebody, but what if my morality were that of a, a Nazi or agent, if you will? You wouldn't want me to be your intelligence officer. Keep the morals out of intelligence. Keep the truth in and stay away from disinformation. It would have been more appropriate for Mr. Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, to address this House according to Article 144, an article which was specifically designed to debate violations of human rights, democracy and the rule of law, which is clearly the case with Mr. Trudeau. Then again, a Prime Minister who openly admires the Chinese basic dictatorship who tramples on fundamental rights by persecuting and criminalizing his own citizens as terrorists just because they dared to stand up to his perverted concept of democracy should not be allowed to speak in this house at all. Mr. Trudeau, you are a disgrace for any democracy. Please spare us your presence. Thank you. And it might sound radical, colleagues, but the answer to war is not more war, it's peace. And peace isn't delivered by the barrel of a gun. It's delivered by diplomacy, by dialogue. You can wish away your continent's history, but we share a continent with Russia. We will sit down with Russia. There will be a negotiated peace, and this organization should be promoting it earlier rather than delaying it and making sure that more Ukrainians die. Your feigning of sympathy rings hollow. It makes me sick, to be honest with you. Is the US a functioning democracy? Well, let's have a look at it. It costs two billion to become president. They're 25% of the total prisoners in the world. They spend over 800 billion a year on arms, which is uh, more than most of the world put together. They've been at war for 250 years since their state was formed 275 years ago. But they can't afford universal health care. They can't afford the 1.7 trillion debt forgiveness for students. They can't afford forward a program for the, one, for the 17 million children that go to bed hungry. Is this a functioning democracy? What's your idea of a democracy? We become involved when disinformation poses a threat to the security of our country. It is when there's a connectivity to th a threat to our country. It could be a threat, a connectivity to violence. And what this, what this working group does, uh, what this working group does is precisely what I would think you would want it to do, which is to take a look at the work, the disinformation work that our department has done and ask the following questions. Do we have policies? Do we have guardrails? Do we have yeah, standards? But here's the problem. Work? We can't I even mean, agree. We can't even mean, agree what disinformation is. This is you well, can't even agree that it was disinformation, that the Russians fed information to the Steele dossier. If you can't agree to that, how are we ever going to come to an agreement on what is disinformation so you can police it on social media? Senator, I have two points, if I may uh, finish. Um, uh, number one, that what this office, what the, I'm sorry, what this working group does, because it's not an office, what this working group does is ensure that there are guardrails, definitions, 
standards to make sure that the free speech rights, the civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy rights of individuals. So are do you not think? Do you think COVID? Do you think and COVID? Two, do you think COVID disinfor, Do you think COVID disinformation threatens our national security? And number two, if I may, Senator, and number two, is it your proposition? that when the cartels spread disinformation with respect to our immigration policies to try to lure vulnerable migrants to our border illegally. I think you've got no idea what disinformation is, and I don't think the government's capable of it. Do you know who the greatest propagator of disinformation in the history of the world is? The U.S. government. Are you familiar with McNamara, the Pentagon Papers? Are you familiar with George W. Bush and the weapons of mass destruction? Are you familiar with Iran-Contra? I mean, think of all the debates and disputes we've had over the last 50 years in our country. We work them out by debating them. We don't work them out by the government being the arbiter. I don't want you to guard guardrails. I want you to have nothing to do with speech. You think we can't determine, you know, speech by traffickers is disinformation? You think the American people are so stupid they need you to tell them what the truth is? You can't even admit what the truth is with a steel dossier. I don't trust government to figure out what the truth is. Senator. Government is largely disseminating disinformation. You would know this well, as a this is a bit of an aside, um, but in terms of how you think about problem sets, I, when I was a cadet. What's the first, what's the cadet motto at West Point? You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. I, I, I was the CI director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. It's like, we, we, had, we, had, entire, we had entire training courses. Uh, we had a good, we had a good d d discussion on ensuring global energy security and adequate oil supplies to support global economic growth. And that will begin shortly. I'm, and, uh, and I'm doing all I can to increase the supply for the United States of America, which I expect to happen. The Saudis share that urgency, and based on our discussions today, I expect we'll see further steps in the coming weeks. Are you worried about it's it? It's One of the hopeful things that I've discovered is that nearly every war that has started in the past 50 years has been a result of media lies. The media could have stopped it if they had searched deep enough, if they hadn't um, reprinted government propaganda, they could have stopped it. But what does that mean? Well, that means basically populations don't like wars. And populations have to be fooled into war. Populations don't willingly and op with open eyes go into a war. So if we have a good media environment, then we will also have a peaceful environment. You killed a that million a people in Iraq. That is a separate... You killed a million people in Iraq. It's incredible that you have the brass neck to be sitting here now urging another Iraq war George, after what you've already done. George, if I was still in done. Parliament, I... I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party that's under the complete control of an elitist cabal of warmongers who are driven by cowardly wokeness, who divide us by racializing every issue and stoking anti-white racism, who actively work to undermine our God-given freedoms that are enshrined in our Constitution, who are hostile to people of faith and spirituality who demonize the police but protect criminals at the expense of law-abiding Americans, who believe in open borders, who weaponize the national security state to go after their political opponents, and above all, 
who are dragging us ever closer to nuclear war. Now, I believe in a government that's of the people, by the people, and for the people. Unfortunately, today's Democratic Party does not. Instead, it stands for a government that is of, by, and for the powerful elite. Now, I'm calling on my fellow common sense, independent-minded Democrats to join me in leaving the Democratic Party. If you can no longer stomach the direction that the so-called woke Democratic Party ideologues are taking our country, then I invite you to join me. your question do you think you should be the one to be able to decide when to pull the trigger no uh, sir isn't that what this is about if you if you adopt the position that any time you are denied you your particular there's four groups out there and respecters you're the group you headed any time you are denied that that ipso facto requires the united states and the security council to act on what they said they would do which is to use whatever means necessary to take on Saddam Hussein so you can get into that particular facility. Is that not correct? Is that not your position? Mr. Senator, I have a job to do, or I had a job to do, and that was to disarm Iraq in accordance with the provisions no, of I relevant got that. resolutions. With all due respect, if you, I'm not trying to be confrontational. I'm trying to get this as clear as I can. I really mean this now. You have an absolute logic. You put together a very tight syllogism here. You have indicated that your job is to disarm. The only way you can disarm is to have access. The only way you can have access is either with permission on the part of Iraq or if denied, forced access, right? Compelled access. Compelled. Well, okay. Compelled. You sound like the lawyer and I sound like the military guy. I mean, uh, you know, compelled where I come from, when my old man said you're compelled, it meant I was forced. I mean, it was a real simple proposition. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't much to debate. Now, there is a clear logic to that. And that's what I mean when I say I respect your position. But that means that whenever you choose a target that warrants inspection and you are denied that ipso facto, at that moment, the only way your position can be satisfied or sustained is if the UN Security Council or the United States acting unilaterally uses force to guarantee access. Is not that true? Yes, sir. Now, that means that you get to choose the time and place when we would use force, if we use force. No, sir. Of course you do. If you choose the site and it's denied. And we coordinate with the member states to include the United States. Exactly. And prior to us going in, we have their agreement that this indeed is an inspection worth doing. Okay, inspection worth doing, everybody's agreed it's worth doing, and it gets stopped. Yes, sir. At that moment, we're an automatic pilot as far as you're concerned. Period. No ifs, ands, or buts. Now, I respect that. But now, it seems to me the Secretary of State might have a slightly different problem. Secretary of State might be sitting there and saying, now look over there on that side. Now, I remember so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and the 12 people on this side, they're all the ones that said they didn't want to use force. Now, I'm going to have to go tell the president now that we should, or Secretary Cohen, unleash whatever it takes to get it done. And our military assessment is the same as the majors. The majors assessment is, privately held but publicly acknowledged later, that airstrikes alone aren't going to do this. Saddam's not going to cave on this. So, now here's the deal. I recommended the president have at it and let the chips fall where they may. A reasonable position for the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State to take. But I respectfully suggest, Major, I respectfully suggest they have a responsibility slightly above your pay grade. Slightly above your pay grade. To decide whether or not to take the nation to war alone or to take the nation to war partway, or to take the nation to war half at, halfway. That's a real tough decision. That's why they get paid the big bucks. 
That's why they get the limos and you don't. I mean this sincerely. I'm not trying to be flip because I think, and that's why I said at the outset, the reason why I'm glad you did what you did, we should come to our milk. We should make a decision. But in terms of whether the Secretary of State has no more to consider than you do as the arms inspector. You didn't get in, didn't get my job done, get me in. Period. You made the deal, right? That's the deal. A deal's a deal. Get me in. Scott Ritter, I'm ready to go. It's not how it works. Now, maybe it should work that way. But I, wouldn't you acknowledge that if you were President of the United States or the Secretary of State, you'd sit there and say, now, okay, old Scotty boy didn't get in. We said he should get in. We want him to get in. It's important that he does get in. They're not going to let him in, so what are we going to do now? We know that France and Russia aren't going to be with us. We're quite confident China's not. We've already run those traps. They're not there. We're not sure where the United States Senate is, but have at it, boys. Go get them. And by the way, Scott and the boys say air power's not enough. I think it's a legitimate debate, Scott, or, uh, Major. I think it's a legitimate debate. But I don't think we should be putting it in the context of, you have somebody up there at state saying, look, how can we weasel out of this agreement? We want to let this guy out there hanging. We're not, we're not this. It's a very practical political decision. Same kind of decision General Powell made. Same kind of decision President Bush made. Every president, every secretary of state has to do it. Like I said, they get paid more than you. Their job's a hell of a lot more complicated than yours. They may have made the wrong decision, and you brought it to light. We should address it. We should say straight up where we are, and we should do it. And for that, I thank you. But it's above your pay grade. One of the four principal functions of the CIA is to gather intelligence and, and ideally forward it to the, the president, the users of information, the policymakers, as they say. There are other functions, however, some of them more legitimate than others. One is to run secret wars, the covert action that's written and talked about so much, like what's happening in Nicaragua today from Honduras. Another thing is to disseminate propaganda to influence people's minds and this is a major function of the CIA and uh, unfortunately of course it overlaps into the gathering of information you, you have contact with a journalist you will give him true stories you'll get information from him you'll also give him false stories for example in my my war the Angola war that I helped to manage uh, one third of my staff was propaganda. Ironically, it's called covert action inside the CIA. Outside, that means the violent part. Uh, I had propagandists all over the world, principally in London, Kinshasa, and Zambia. We would take stories which we would write and put them in the Zambia time, and then pull them out and send them to a, a journalist on our payroll in Europe. But his cover story, you see, would be that he, would, he had gotten them from his stringer in Lusaka, who had gotten them from the Zambia time. We had the complicity of the government of Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda, if you will, to put these false stories into his newspapers. But after that point, the journalists, uh, Reuters and AFP, uh, the management was not witting of it. Now, our contact man in Europe was, and we pumped just, just dozens of stories about Cuban atrocities, Cuban rapists. Uh, in one case, we had the Cuban rapists caught uh, and tried by the Ovimbundu maidens who had been their victims, and then we ran photographs that made almost every newspaper in the country of the Cubans being executed by the Ovimbunda women who supposedly had been their victims. But these were and fake photos? Oh, absolutely. We didn't know of one single atrocity committed by the Cubans. It was pure, raw, false propaganda to, to create a, an illusion of communists, you know, eating babies for breakfast and that sort of totally false propaganda. The only reason that I'm allowed to ask you this question is because today the federal court ruled that the government doesn't have the right to determine who is or is not a journalist. This is the second election in a row 
that the court had to overturn your government, do you still insist on being able to make that decision and why? First of all, questions around accreditation were handled by the press gallery and the consortium of uh, networks who have uh, strong perspectives on quality journalism and the important information that is shared with Canadians. Uh, the reality is organizations, organizations like yours uh, that continue to spread misinformation and disinformation on the science around vaccines, around how we're going to actually get through this pandemic and be there for each other and keep our kids safe is part of why we're seeing such um, unfortunate uh, anger and lack of understanding of basic science. And quite frankly, your, I won't call it a media organization, your group of uh, individuals uh, need to take accountability for uh, some of the polarization that we're seeing in this country. And I think Canadians uh, are cluing into the fact that uh, there is a really important decision we take about the kind of country we want to see. And I salute all extraordinary hardworking journalists that put science and facts at the heart of what they do and ask me tough questions every day, uh, but make sure that they are educating and informing Canadians from a broad range of perspectives, which is the last thing that you guys do. Whatever our hopes may be for the future, for reducing this threat or living with it, there is no escaping either the gravity or the totality of its challenge to our survival and to our security a challenge that confronts us in unaccustomed ways in every sphere of human activity. This deadly challenge imposes upon our society two requirements of direct concern, both to the press and to the president. Two requirements that may seem almost contradictory in tone, but which must be reconciled and fulfilled if we are to meet this national peril. I refer first to the need for far greater public information and second to the need for far greater official secrecy. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know.
go. Welcome, everybody, to Redacted on this Thursday. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And boy, do we have a show lined up for you on this Thursday. We didn't cut any corners. Uh, this, uh, boy, we are, the, the country is under attack, is under, uh, under siege from a, basically a runaway corrupt government. And wow, we have these whistleblower testimonies this afternoon, which we're going to go through uh, as it relates to what happened on January 6th. These FBI whistleblower testimonies are unbelievable. I sat there just over the last like hour with my jaw dropped um, at the corruption, the uh, the retaliation against these people, lives ruined because they went after these FBI agents who spoke out. They were brave. Um, we're going to go through this. It's unbelievable. But we now have confirmation of the FBI being actively involved on January 6th, even though the head of the FBI lied under oath in his testimony about that exact involvement. So we're going to unpack all of this. Uh, we're also going to give you an update on the war in Ukraine uh, about all of those uh, military, all of the military equipment that Western uh, nations are paying for, what's going on there. Um, most of them are up in smoke. That's a bit of a spoiler. Yeah, massive. This was perhaps the largest attack since the beginning of the war. So we're going to unpack what happened last night and what is continuing to happen right now as the, almost all of the electrical grid is completely shut down in Ukraine. Is this a moment, like a moment right before a massive offensive from Vladimir Putin? Uh, plus, we're going to give you an update on whether or not your hospital is being trained on how to use transgender pronouns um, and how to now identify bodies, sexed bodies. And if they don't do a good job, there are many lobbyists there that are going to give them a bad grade. Uh, so you know that the next time you go for a checkup, if they don't call your body by certain body parts, this might be why. Man, this is a this is a society in total collapse. We've also got Michael Yan. He's going to be on the show uh, from the border, from the Yuma, Arizona border. He was up all night uh, out there. And we also have the latest tranche of Twitter files that no one is covering in the mainstream media. It's being totally ignored because it involves journalists. So we're going to go through that and so much more as Redacted starts right now. Welcome, everyone, to the show. Thank you so much for subscribing. We're close to 2 million subscribers on YouTube, almost uh, close to 340,000 on Rumble. Thank you for making this a part of your day. I saw someone in the chat just a few minutes ago saying, this is the second best show behind Tucker. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take All that. All right. That second, show doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, there so. is no Tucker show. <laughs> so I will take that. You see they're replacing him with Hannity, by the way. What a disaster that's going to be. Go ahead, Philip. Well, that, by, by that comparison, that makes us de facto the best show yeah, out there. Yeah, we'll take we'll, it. We'll really appreciate that. We'll take it. Uh, so thank you for subscribing. Um, so subscribe to the channel. Just click that subscribe button. Smash that like button. If you smash the like button, it pushes us further out in the algorithm. But tonight, it's Thursday. We've got so much news to get to. I don't want to waste any more time. Let's get to our top story, which, of course, is what's going on with the FBI. So today, the FBI uh, confirmed, confirmed in front of Congress that confidential informants FBI assets were present at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Now, they may have done this a little bit unwittingly, but they were doing this because today we had a congressional testimony from several FBI whistleblowers, not just one, who had claimed that they were concerned that the civil liberties were being compromised of the people that they were going after uh, when in pursuit of January 6th participants. Now, there's a big piece of these testimonies that have nothing to do with January 6th. We should mention that, but we're going to specifically focus on the January 6th piece of this because a number of whistleblowers also talked about being asked to go after it and, and investigate school board meetings and taking the license plates of people who are going to school board meetings. Like, really? Can you imagine? Like, hey, honey, I'm going to a school board meeting tonight. Oh, and the FBI is tracking you because you're going to the school? That was also part of this, uh, but that's not what we're going to specifically focus on. January 6th is what we're going to look at. So all of those people out there, all of you guys that were vilified for or called a conspiracy nut for saying that the FBI was actively involved on January 6th, you have now been vindicated. You have now been vindicated. So if you've got a family member 
who's like, oh, Janice, you're just one of those conspiracy nuts. Show them tonight's episode and show them this testimony that we're about to show you. Whistleblowers admitting that FBI Director Christopher Wray lied under oath to Congress that no FBI agents were present during the January 6th riots. Now, I think it's worth noting before we get into this, because already there's a contingency of Democratic congress congressional leaders who are saying, well, this is just sort of the latest move by MAGA Trump Republicans. Uh, this should have nothing to do with politics at all. This is an FBI whistleblower who said if these people multiple. did multiple multiple uh, who had said even before this hearing, if these people did something wrong and we take them to trial, we will lose because we are infringing on their civil liberties. This is what he was concerned about, is that we can't bring the hammer on these people until we see what it is we've got against them. And if they are cooperating, we shouldn't be breaking down their doors and infringing on their civil rights. He was concerned. He, he wasn't saying, I won't go after these people. What he was initially saying is the way in which we're doing it is outside of protocol. We should all be concerned about this. It should have nothing to do with Biden or Trump. We know that the crux of that day was about the election, but really, it no longer is about politics. So when we say Demo when we see Democrats just crying about how, oh, this is a this is a MAGA apologist move, we should reject that uh, as partisan politics. All right, let's get into it. So whistleblowers admitting that Christopher Ray uh, lied under oath to Congress that no FBI agents were present during the day on January sixth, um, and so we'll get to that part of it in a moment. But first, the House of Representatives held a hearing today where the FBI whistleblowers came forward to. Ex expose the corruption and the illegality of what's happening inside the FBI. They also exposed how the FBI bullied and retaliated against FBI agents, patriots, by the way, who served multiple tours uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, who are members of the 101st Airborne Division, who were, had medals from the U.S. military, as well as commendations from the FBI. These people were smeared by other FBI agents and higher ups within the FBI, and they were retaliated against by the FBI who saw this corruption going on. And they saw this. They saw this and they tried to stop it. They tried to bring it to the attention of their superiors and they tried to stop it. They were retaliated against. One of these American patriots is FBI Special Agent Garrett O'Boyle, who served in Iraq. He served in the 101st Airborne Division, which if you know anything about those guys, it doesn't get any braver than that. Um, when he blew the whistle, listen to what they did to him. He also says that many in the FBI know how corrupt it, how corrupt the FBI is. He says many of his colleagues knew how corrupt the FBI was, but they were basically wimps. And he said that they were just cowards because they wouldn't come forward and admit it. But they would rather just collect a paycheck than do the right thing. Listen to Garrett O'Boyle. Thank you for addressing FBI malfeasance and allowing me to speak today. Aside from that point of gratitude, I'm sad, I'm disappointed, and I'm angry that I have to be here to testify about the weaponization of the FBI and DOJ. During my four years as a special agent, I received the highest annual review an employee can receive. I volunteered for, tried out for, and was selected for an FBI SWAT team. I also volunteered for, tried out for, and was selected for a new unit the FBI created. I also received an award for my work on an anti-abortion extremism case. I've been smeared as a malcontent and subpar FBI employee. Too many in the FBI aren't willing to sacrifice for the hard right over the easy wrong. They see what becomes of whistleblowers, how the FBI destroys their careers, suspends them under false pretenses, takes their security clearances and pay with no true options for real recourse or remedy. I couldn't knowingly continue on this path silently without speaking out against the weaponization I witnessed, even if it meant losing my job, my career, my livelihood, my family's home, and now my anonymity. My oath, however, did not include sacrificing the hopes dreams, and livelihood of my family, my strong, beautiful, and courageous wife, and our four sweet and beautiful daughters who have endured this process along with me. In weaponized fashion, the FBI allowed me to accept orders to a new position halfway across the country. They allowed us to sell my family's home. They ordered me to report to the new unit when our youngest daughter was two weeks old. Then, on my first day on the new assignment, they suspended me, rendering my family homeless. <clears throat> They refused to release our goods, including our clothes, for weeks. <clears throat> All I wanted to do was serve my country by stopping bad guys and protecting the innocent. To my chagrin, bad guys have begun running parts of the government, making it difficult to continue to serve this nation and protect the innocent. 
but I, for one, will never stop trying, and I'll never forget my oath. And no. his oath, you know, and his oath is to put his country first, right? And uh, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, and you know, when you read these, you know, books about these investigators and it, books about these whistleblowers, you realize that they are actually trained to be upstanding uh, crime investigators. They are trained on a protocol of what is right and what is wrong. This is it comes across pretty clear. Um, I think if one thing America gets right is that it's written down how to be good, but Lately, it just seems like there are too many people who get away with not going by the books anymore. Right. And so because if you're, it, of this precedence. So if he has friends, colleagues, which we're going to play another soundbite from him in a few minutes, and it's probably one of the most amazing pieces of video I've seen. We're going to, you, you, you have to watch what he says. It's, it's sickening and it's oh, really just cuts you, really just cuts you. But you realize that all of these colleagues that were around him saw a lot of them knew that what the FBI was doing was corruption that uh, they were what they were doing was in many ways illegal and they and none of them would come forward they knew that they would be retaliated against so he comes forward and he's brave and now he has lost his anonymity and now as of like over the past 24 hours apparently security clearance revoked because the retaliation is even stronger now so so much for whistleblower protections as he comes forward he gets vilified has his family moved forced to move across the country and sell the home and retaliated against. Right. We're not going to give you your clothes. And then, you know, bigger the questions. Winter. What happens to your pension? What happens to your retirement when you're treated this way? When yeah. you're, uh, I don't know what the FBI version of dishonorable discharge, um, you know, apparently. Yeah. And so these yeah. are these are important questions. So how did Democrats respond to this today? You know, this committee hearing, this is the weaponization hearing. So here's just a little taste of how Democrats responded by basically trying to smear one of the FBI agent whistleblowers. Uh, basically, Congresswoman Sanchez questions uh, one of these. Uh, Marcus Allen tries to basically question his allegiance to the United States. This guy is a decorated hero. Uh, in the United States. So Congressman Sanchez, a Democrat, on the Weaponization Committee tries to expose FBI whistleblower by bringing up his Twitter activity. She's like, oh, I'm going to get this guy because he may have tweeted something a couple of years ago that really shows where, where his head was at on this. There's just one problem. The account, the Twitter account that she tries to get him with, like with her little zinger, it's not his account, has nothing to do with him. It's like she just went to the internet and did a search for Marcus Allen on Twitter, and she grab, grabbed one, one random Twitter account. Watch this amazing exchange. Thank you. Mr. Allen, have you ever used Twitter, yes or no? I have utilized Twitter, yes. Okay, and is your account at Marcus A97050645? That is absolutely not my account. <laughs> okay, that's not your account. Well, on December 5th, 2022, an account under the name Marcus Allen retweeted a tweet that said, That quote, is not my account, ma'am. You haven't let me finish the question, you might sir. Have been the football player. You haven't let me finish the question. <laughs> On and the time is mine. On December 5th, 2022, an account under the name of Marcus Allen retweeted a tweet that said, quote, Nancy Pelosi staged January 6th. Retweet if you agree, end quote. Do you agree with that statement? Yes or no? That that is I don't no ma'am that's not my account at all I have I'm no asking idea. whether you agree with that statement yes or no Can you please rephrase the statement Yeah the Do you think I'm the gentle lady has expired staged January 6th <laughs> I just want him to answer He'll answer he'll answer question. Yeah he'll answer I just telling you your time's up Do you believe that Nancy Pelosi do you agree with the statement that this person tweeted that Nancy Pelosi staged January 6th Yes I, or I no No Thank you Listen to her back I listen, gotcha. Listen to her backpedaling. She's like, okay, so this, you didn't tweet it. You didn't tweet it, but do you agree with this random tweet from some guy who has a similar name as you? Also, this cat is the name of the last thing you ate. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to play that game on Twitter? Taco no? cat. Taco cat. Okay. <laughs> this has, ma'am, this account, I, I appreciate your purple hair, That's but this account has thinking. nothing to do with me. What Wasn't the hell? Was Marcus Allen a raider? Yeah, he was That's a football player. Someone was Famous like, is, player. is he the, the football player yeah. that we're talking about? Yeah, like, I know. Like, this, this is, is a random. Of but nothing. This, is, this is literally what Democrats did this afternoon in this committee and, hearing. Unbelievable and sick. It's, it's, basically, it's basically like she was trying to use the Chewbacca defense. Like, why What's am I reading Chewbacca this random tweet? The, the, Chewbacca, the Chewbacca defense, it's like the, 
uh, it's a South Park thing, but where the guy's like, the, the lawyer is talking about Chewbacca, and he's like, he's like, why would I be talking about Chewbacca when this man's <laughs> life is on the line? He's like, that doesn't make any sense. He's like, if it don't make sense, you have to acquit. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's crazy. So this is even more crazy. So Matt Gates really laid into it and laid out this whole the, laid out this whole thing. So here is perhaps the nut of this. This is where we learn what was unfolding on that day. Who was there? What FBI agents were actively involved? in the crowd as either informants uh, or part of it. Um, and you get to see not only um, Marcus Allen talking about what happened, but then you also hear from the Boston field office, the Boston field office testimony where the agent was saying, we weren't going to round these people up unless you shared video with us of the actual people inside the Capitol. We're not just going to randomly go and arrest people. Why don't you share with us this video that you have? You have 11,000 hours of this. This is an FBI agent saying this. And they, it turns out they didn't want to share the 11,000 hours of footage with him in the Boston field office because they admitted that there was FBI agents in the video footage. They were admitting that their own people were there that day. Watch this amazing few moments. Mr. Allen, we just heard, uh, astonishingly heard a Democrat on this committee question your allegiance to the United States. How many tours in Iraq did you do? I did two tours in Iraq, sir. And, and for how many decades have you held a security clearance? Uh, for two decades, sir. Ever been called into question before? No, sir. And, and you also received the Employee of the Year Award for the Charlotte Field Office, is that right? That is correct, sir. Did you receive any medals during your service for the Marine Corps and the United States Navy? I did, sir. As a member of the Marine Corps, I received two, uh, a Navy Commendation Medal and a Navy Achievement Medal. Seems to me your allegiance to the United States is pretty well established over multiple decades, wearing the uniform, fighting for our country, and I am proud that you continue to fight for our country as a whistleblower here, making a disclosure to the United States Congress. Uh, and Mr. Allen, is it your belief that you were retaliated against because you shared an email that questioned the truthfulness of FBI Director Christopher Wray. Yes, sir. And you believed that he wasn't truthful based on testimony he'd given to the United States Senate, isn't that right? Yes, sir. And in that testimony to the Senate, you believe that Christopher Wray indicated that there were no confidential informants and no uh, FBI assets that were present at the Capitol on January 6th that were part of the violent riot. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. Please play the video. We're, we're now going to hear from George Hill, who worked at the Boston field office. So now this is the Boston field office where he's being asked to basically round up individuals. The SSA in Boston said they were going to a political rally, which is First Amendment protected activity. No, we're not uploading. We're not starting cases on these people. To which they said, well, we're going to call your SAC, and the SSA said, go right ahead. Because when you're pushing back, you know, you want to make sure that you have your, your six covered. So the SAC and the ASAC were intimately aware of these kinds of exchanges that were going on. And again, to his credit, um, Joe Bonavolanta said, no, we're not opening up cases on people who went to a rally and I forgot a key part. The SSA for CT2 said, happy to do it, show us where they were inside the Capitol and we'll look into it. To which WFO said, we can't show you those videos unless you can tell us the exact time and place those individuals were inside the Capitol. To which the SSA responded back, and I was privy to these conversations firsthand, why can't you show us why can't you just send us the, give us access to the 11,000 hours of video of this exam that's available? Because there may be, may be UCs, undercover officers, or CHS's confidential human for confidential human sources on those videos whose identity we need to protect. Ah, uh, so FBI in the crowd. I want you to hear. Hold on, we'll just play the end of this. But that is an amazing moment. So we can't share with you the 11th. So we're going to go arrest people who were on the grounds that day for an, a constitutionally protected event who were just outside the event. 
We're just going to go round those people up. You want to share share the video with us? I think this also shows not just that there's bravery inside these whistleblowers, but there's bravery inside agents who refuse to do it. Yeah. That there are adults in the room who are saying there is such a thing as civil liberties, and we're not going to do that until we see it. Uh, that means we do not have then sort of blind soldiers rounding people up like in the Hunger Games like right troopers. now. We yeah. don't have that. Uh, and so if there's a silver lining to this, it's hearing about these stories, whether those people became whistleblowers or not. Silver lining, a few of them, right? Because we know how many people, the, one of the largest dragnets in American history, busting down doors right. in the dark, you know, cover of darkness. Brandon Straka, for instance. Do we have that soundbite of Brandon Straka? Um, Brandon Straka was on yep. our show. Brandon Straka was on our show, of course, and we did a whole redacted conversation with him. He had his life turned upside down. He was there to give a speech that day. And he comes out of the subway and he's like, oh, there's lots of people here. He was on the one side of the Capitol, not where like people were, you know, smashing doors. He was on the back side of the Capitol and he was filming it and uh, he was on his way to give a speech. And then suddenly, like a few weeks later, guess who shows up at his door and then throws him into solitary confinement? Watch this. So exactly two and a half weeks after January 6th, on the morning of Monday, January 25th, um, I woke up at dawn to the sound of... Boom, 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 boom. And I shot up in my bed and um, I knew instantly, instantly I was like, oh my God. I just, I just remember thinking, oh my God, this really is happening. Wow. Like they really did, they really did come. Like this is, I just thought it was like nut, but I didn't even have time to process the thought or the feeling because the way that they were pounding on my door, I knew they were gonna break it down if I didn't get there like fast and so i jumped out of bed i threw some pants on and i went like scurrying to my door and and i just said who's out there and they said fbi open up and so i opened the door and on the other side was a team of fbi agents in tactical gear vests helmets etc and uh they came into my apartment and there was one man who I refer to as the lead agent because he did all the talking. And he said to me, do you know why we're here? And I said, no. And he said, you have no idea why we're here. And I said, well, I'm assuming you're here in conjunction with January 6th, but I don't know why you're here. Like, right. what, what, why are, what do you want with me? Right. And, um, and he said, well, you're facing multiple felony charges for what you did on January 6th. And I remember I said, felonies. I said, I didn't even commit any crimes. And he said to me, oh, I saw your video. I, uh, you, trust me, yeah, I saw what you did. <laughs> but we can't see the video. We're not gonna share the video. We're not gonna share it as evidence so that you can exonerate yourself. You can use it in a court of law. We're gonna, we've seen the videos. Open up, Gestapo. So that's Brandon Straka. Now, it, this is, I love how, let me go back to that video, if we can, of um, the Matt Gates thing. Sorry to, if we can, but now it might. Uh, did, yeah, did, uh, let me see what I can do. It might have reset itself. That's okay. He comes back and he's pointing out that, well, here you go. He specifically asked, did the FBI ever try to get you to do something, he asks Marcus Allen, that was outside the normal order of law enforcement? So we don't need to go back to it unless you have it. Um, he, he said, he asked him, he no, said, no, he said, did the FBI ever try to get you to do something that was outside the normal order of law enforcement activity? And then uh, to which uh, to which uh, Garrett O'Boyle said yes. And he has said violence on January 6th doesn't justify weaponizing the government against people who were innocent and did nothing wrong. Thank you for blowing the whistle. That's what he said to to O'Boyle at the end of the, after that video played. So I just want to play for you now. Oh, yeah, this is D.C. Drano tweeted this a, sh a few minutes ago and said, FBI whistleblower testifies under oath that FBI won't allow 11,000 hours of January 6th footage to be released because it would expose undercover agents committing crimes inside the Capitol. Not only was J6 a Fed setup, he says, but now it's confirmed that FBI is also covering its tracks. Now, remember, just a few days ago, we got the Durham report about how the FBI was mobilized to do political favors for the Clinton campaign by investigating the Russiagate uh, controversy without reliable and credible evidence. Now, the FBI's response to this just three days ago was, 
yeah, we've made some changes since 2016, 2017. We've got to do better. This would not happen again. So we were told, so January 6th was now, what, two years ago. But we've been told that six years ago, there was, there's been some changes since right. 2016, 2017. Great point. Great point, right. So they were telling us that what they did in 2016 has now been, they, they've taken corrective actions. They're better actions. now, right? And so will we then see them say, yeah, we shouldn't have done that either. We've made changes since 2021, 2022. I mean, we need some response from this because well, of course, and we need and we need now we need the, the the judiciary committee and others to do something, not just hold hearings and fundraise off of this stuff. You know, these congressmen then go and like, "Yeah, we we did this and we're going to fundraise off." Because of what normally happens when Congress comes up with something that they think is bad, they can either impeach somebody uh, well, who are they going to impeach over this? Or they can refer to the Justice Department. They absolutely cannot refer the Justice Department to the Justice Department, though. Like here, our hands are tied. Yeah. So this is a most amazing piece of video. I want you to watch this. So O'Boyle, I know everyone in the chat saying O'Boyle rules. You know that reference from a movie. Um, I don't. <laughs> Garrett O'Boyle. Philip, you know the movie, right? No. Oh, yeah, that's a Billy Madison. Yeah. O'Doyle rules. That's not O'Boyle. I know, but it's oh. a play on O'Boyle. Get it? O'Doyle, O'Boyle. No, I, I don't. Okay, do you need some help? In this? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> here's some more coffee here. Um, so, O'Boyle, uh, t you know, he came forward. He was one of the whistleblowers that came forward and told everyone what was happening. While he admits other agents around him were cowards and wouldn't come forward and saw saw the malfeasance happening but refused to come forward because of risk of retaliation risk of retaliation and they'd rather just collect their paycheck like we're not going to do this we're not going to raise you know we're not going to raise the alarm about this i just need a paycheck i just want a paycheck so a con member of congress asks o'boyle if you had to do it again if you have advice for other people to talk about this malfeasance and come forward what would you say to them? Watch this amazing moment. All of the hardships you've gone through. If one of your really good friends, your former colleagues, came to you and said, I have this thing that is being covered up, and I think the American people know to, know, need to know about it, what advice would you give them? I would tell them first to pray about it long and hard. And I would tell them I could take it to Congress for them, or I could put them in touch with Congress, but I would advise them not to do it. So you would legitimately try to protect one of your colleagues from doing what you have done? Absolutely. And how do you think that solves being able to shine light on corruption, weaponization, any kind of misconduct that exists with the American people? It doesn't solve it. But the FBI will crush you. This government will crush you and your family if you try to expose the truth about things that they are doing that are wrong. And we are all examples of that. I can't think of a more sobering way to end a hearing. I yield back. Can you imagine? I mean, I get chills. It makes me want to cry that they ruined this guy's life. Yeah. These scumbags ruined this guy's life because he saw what they were doing was wrong and followed the proper channels of whistleblower protection. Then they retaliate against him, remove his security clearance, smear him, ship him across the country, put him in some random field office, force him to sell his home, don't give him his, his, his children, his little girls, access to their clothing because he wanted to do the right thing. Remember yeah, that. That must be terrifying. Awful. So how did Democrats, how did the liberal media this afternoon spin all this? This is amazing. So um, Punchbowl News which is a Washington insider, Jake Sherman operation. Um, I think he was formerly at Politico or I forget where he was. Anyway, so they publish this newsletter. They do a morning publish. They do a midday publish and an afternoon publish. And so their midday publish was covering this weaponization hearing, but they buried it all the way at the bottom. Like, really? This is a pretty big story that's buried at the bottom of the newsletter this afternoon. And they also framed it this way. GOP's weaponization hearing witnesses spark credibility questions. So Punchbowl News is using the New York Times strategy of basically uh, calling into question these witnesses and basically saying, well, the, you know, these, 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 uh, these agents, they have low credibility because apparently the FBI yesterday revoked their security clearance. So 
The FBI retaliated against them, revoked their security clearance, and then today that makes them less credible? In the same week that IRS agents were removed from the Hunter Biden case, like, they're just, they're so ballsy. Like, (laughs) let's just do all the bad stuff in public because if we do it all at the same time, nobody can do anything. So the, the FBI pulled the agents clearances over their conduct related to January 6th, the New York Times first reported. Oh, Marcus Allen, Steve Friend testified before the committee today. Why did they remove their security clearance? Because apparently they didn't want to be a part of a SWAT team that broke down the doors of people that didn't deserve to have their house broken down into and rounded up and thrown into solitary confinement, just like Brandon Straka did. Especially people who Friend had said earlier this year that they had already been in contact with these people. These people had already been cooperating with their lines of questioning. And so there was no need. These people were like, great, call me later. I'll tell you more what I know about January 6th. And then they go and break down their door. Again, one of the major points that he had made is like, if this person's guilty, we will lose the case because we violated their civil liberties. And there were people in the organization who just didn't care about that protocol. And you know, where were the lawyers to stop this? Because the agents are not necessarily lawyers, but they're briefed on the law, what's legal and what's not legal to go after a citizen, a person. Um, And so, you know, where were the lawyers behind this, giving the green light for this kind of thing? There should be a chain of command that stops this. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Let us know your thoughts on this in the comments below. What should happen to the FBI? I've seen all sorts of people saying defund it. Uh, What about Christopher Wray as the head of the FBI? You know, he was appointed. Let's not forget it. I think he was appointed under Trump. He's still there. Um, Now he's Biden's guy. Like I I don't understand, though, that what's the rationale? Can you walk me through the defund the FBI? Because then what? Because we already live in a town in a time when urban centers are lawless, completely lawless. It's not like they're stopping that. Right. But we all, I think, want to live in a place that is not that is lawless. policed and is protected. Right. right? We've seen we've seen the there defund is police equal movement. protection right. under the law for all of us. Um, and these agents are saying what they've been investigating was uh, drug trafficking. Sex uh, what trafficking. did they say? Extremists, um, you know, certain extremisms, um, grape with a G cases. Uh, yeah. Child trafficking. So who does that then? Right. Do we just start over? Do we make something new that does that? Well, maybe we take away, you know, all of the money that they've spent on these, uh, you know, inclusivity handbooks. Like so the FBI apparently handed out handbooks that showed, you know, symbols to their agents that if you see anyone with a Betsy Ross flag, that's an extremist. That That's a potential extremist person. If they've got a Betsy Ross American flag. So if someone flies a Betsy Ross American flag, then they, they're probably a white supremacist and you, you should probably go and round them up or probably keep a really close eye on them. Going to school board meetings, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So giving them all of this extra money to do these types of things back to their, you know, I don't know, core competencies. I don't know. But this has been going. This is the problem. Is that this has been going on for decades. The weaponization of these sure, intelligence communities. Sure, it's upsetting, but we're already on the precipice of a uh, global uh, social collapse. And what happened after 9-11... It's not helping, it, what, but... No, what happened after 9-11 is that these agencies were given so much more money, right? The idea was, we're going to have the global war on terror, look everywhere. But instead, what do they do? They looked inside, right? So they've started putting all of that money towards like domestic surveillance and abuse of power. That's exactly what this is. This yeah. is abuse of power. So let us know your thoughts on this. Um, in the uh, in the comments below, uh, Judy Brooks says, "I just got booted out of Redacted." No, you didn't. You're um, here. I see you. You're here, unless uh, unless YouTube boots you out. That's how it works sometimes. YouTube doesn't like what you say, and they they block you. So you got to be careful about that. You got to be careful about that. We've got more news to get to. We're going to look at the war in Ukraine next. Uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia launching their biggest attack yet. We're going to go through what this means and what lawmakers are saying funding of of ukraine going forward could ukraine really only have five months left really five months left that's what the financial times is warning as lawmakers and and european leaders are worried that the united states might be pulling its funding up so we'll talk about that Uh, but first are you an investor looking for an easier way to trade some stocks and would you like 20 free stocks right now with mumu which is our favorite trading platform there's no steep learning curve it has a simple interface and you're going to get 20 free stocks when you go to redacted.inc slash mumu. That's right. Just for setting up your account and making your initial deposits, you can get up to 20 free stocks right now for a limited time. 
Amumu has zero commission trades. The app looks amazing on every platform from iOS to Android to Windows and Mac. And like last, like last week here on the show, I told you about a, a gold company um, that I was investing in us gold. And uh, they were like, it was trading at like 10 bucks, a, 10 bucks a share. And, um, and it, and I traded right inside of Mumu, and it's fantastic. And actually, that stock today up fifty uh, percent from what I was telling you about it. Um, could hit the Russell two thousand if it hits fifteen dollars a share. And you can do all of it. You can set alerts for that kind of stuff right inside of Mumu. If you want to track certain companies like I do with these different gold producers and silver producers um, and different metals producers and commodities uh, stocks that I like to buy. So right now, check them out. Open your free Mumu account today. Get access to zero commission trades, twenty free stocks when you open your account. Make your initial deposits. To learn more, check out our link at redacted.inc slash mumu again redacted.inc slash mumu all right i need some uh, need some iced tea all right this is uh, this I, I it's been i haven't been this pissed off in a while like today like going through this january 6 stuff with these fbi whistleblowers i was furious absolutely furious i see that I mean, I was, I felt like this over the Durham report. So well, yeah. we're just, we're just flip-flopping. What's next? What's next? All right. Well, Ukraine is an unmitigated disaster and it will be America's undoing unless we stop this war right now. Those are not my words. Those are the words of multiple senior military officials who have just penned a new piece in the New York Times calling for them to end this stupid unmitigated disaster of a war. We'll get to that part of it in a second, but overnight... Vladimir Putin just launched his biggest attack of the war so far. Analysts are saying the amount, the size, the scope was by far the largest attack since the start of this war. According to multiple reports this morning that we've been piecing together from different sources, overnight and into early daylight hours, Russian aerospace forces started pounding targets in the southern part of Ukraine, specifically NATO targets. These are NATO targets because who's running this war? It's not Ukraine. It's NATO. And so they started hitting these NATO targets near Odessa. Uh, these targets are NATO staging grounds uh, that receive cargo from Romania. Most targets are NATO weapons depots, ammunition warehouses, railroads, logistics. Ukrainian Energy Ministry admits that over 20 towns right now, as of this broadcast, and, and are cities without power right now. Um, because of these overnight and into this morning Russian airstrikes. So here is the strike that hit these uh, areas in Odessa. These are in the dark of night, hitting these supply depots uh, in Odessa and other parts of the country. Uh, this actually, this yeah, yeah, this is uh, in the Nikolaev area. According to reports, more than 10 NATO shipment arrivals landed at these storage facilities. This equipment would then be transferred to the armed forces of Ukraine. Ukraine would then use these weapons to continue shelling the Donbass region, which they did overnight. So this is amazing that Ukraine, even under all of this like attack, hitting all of their ammunition depots and everything else, they still managed to fire on the Donbass and still target uh, still target residential areas like they're sticking to it. They're sticking to their guns on this. It's unbelievable. Uh, they hit multiple civilian targets overnight, did Ukraine. Ukraine spoke, uh, hit multiple residential areas. Apartment complexes were hit. One particularly tragic story, journalist Steve Sweeney, uh, who's in the Donbass reporting, uh, says that a woman who was killed during Ukraine shelling of Donetsk's uh, Petrovsky district yesterday has been named as Ilona Nikolaevna. Um, she stopped on her way to work to provide emergency care to those who were just wounded in another shelling attack. As she was helping them, another rocket struck and then she died instantly. Oh, there's a name for this. Actually, that's a, a, a tactic I've read about that the United States has used in um, Arabic speaking countries and their war on terrorism. What is called? So I don't know the name of it. or something like that. Or anybody else in the chat know what this um, is? This is a this is a tactic where you bomb once and then when rescue workers come in, you bomb again. You bomb again. So that's exactly what Ukraine did here. Uh, but they're doing I'm it. With, find they're it. doing it with civilians. Uh, but then NATO forces launched another shell. You know, they killed her and wounded civilians nearby. So here is a local shop that was also shelled by Ukrainian forces just before noon, one of the busiest times of the day. Uh, one man had his legs blown off, was fighting for his life at this hour. Four others were injured. Again, these are civilians, shop owners. Uh, this is daily life, though, of course, for the residents of the Donbass who face daily shelling in this genocide. So this NATO weapons depot was hit hard. 
hit hard overnight, destroying all of these new NATO weapons that just arrived from Romania. Take a look. And the air defense system sitting next to the airport runway uh, was totally destroyed. Um, so these, again, are NATO depots that were totally destroyed. Baiting, some people are saying it's called a uh, double tap. I, th double, th double I tap. thought it was double Grim, tap. Grim just said double tap. Double yeah. tap. Double tap. So you, yeah, you bomb an area. Uh, so Ukraine bombs an area. Civilians go to help. And then like, hey, and then we're going to just fire them again. We're going to shoot them in and, you know, fire them up again. That's great. Um, that's what they do. But that's just one example. And then around 4 a.m., Putin launched a massive barrage of attacks with caliber and possibly hypersonic missiles, according to reports. These struck countless air defense uh, targets all over central Ukraine. These strikes were similar to what we saw about 48 hours ago, taking out uh, a lot of air defense targets. Other reports coming in today showing Russia hit Ukrainian military uh, behind their lines uh, in the Kharkiv and uh, or Kharkov and Kherson area in the Nikolaev region. Again, according to the military reports we're getting, this is the largest attack of the war so far since the first days of the so-called uh, special military operation. And as Colonel Douglas McGregor told us last night, Putin hasn't even done anything yet, that these are just small jabs and he hasn't even like launched the right hook yet, the massive offensive that could be coming in the first few weeks of June. Listen. And right now, Putin and his forces have been acting like a, a heavyweight champion that only uses a left jab. In other words, he's jabbing with all of these strikes and doing enormous damage. He hasn't let loose his right which are hundreds of thousands of Russian combat troops. So the future doesn't look good if you're sitting in, in Kiev, if you're Ukrainian right now. Does that make any difference to people in Washington? Yes, but what can they do? They can double down. So are they going to double down? European leaders are worried that the United States is not doubling down. In fact, the Financial Times reporting this morning that Ukraine's allies fear the military support will fade in a U.S. election year and only five months are left of money and funding and that the United States might not fund it after that. Let's quote from the from the Financial Times. Washington has been Ukraine's dominant source of weaponry and U.S. officials say sufficient pre-approved funds remain to sustain Kiev for about five more months. That's it covering a crucial counteroffensive planned for the coming weeks. I love how they keep saying that Ukraine's about to launch a counteroffensive in the coming weeks. Well, actually, just saying. just today I, I saw, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, that they're saying, well, there's a, a mini counteroffensive before the counteroffensive. It's oh, okay. like a little like an prep jump. Yeah, oh, okay. or a moose. Yes. Uh, and a moose boost. This dress rehearsal. Yes. <laughs> the, the like this rehearsal. this has happened. It's the mini before the real thing happens. And so there was a little bit of gains on the battlefield and we're calling it the the, the pre the pre show. I uh, guess. Uh, what, what, Opening what, act. It's like what gains on the battlefield? Literally Bakhmut is about to fall, is totally is basically totally co uh, collapsed and, and surrounded by Russian forces. W w where where is this little mini offensive? I mean, maybe they've hitting some targets inside of Russia with long range weapons from NATO, but that's about it. Um, European allies, though, are increasingly uncertain about whether the U.S. will come close to matching its existing $48 billion package, according to the Financial Times, adopted in 2022, they say, particularly as it requires a vote in Congress this autumn against the backdrop of more partisan debate on the war. So they're basically saying they're going to try to vote on it, and there's no way. Well, there was a proposed bill to make it U.S. law to support Ukraine until the bitter end. It hasn't gone anywhere, thankfully. But if that were to pass, then there'll be no haggling over this package and then that package and then that package like COVID relief aid. Um, it just would be open checkbook. No one knows, said a European official, one of 10 senior figures in countries allied with Ukraine who spoke to the Financial Times about the next phase of the war. The final paragraph here, we can't keep the same level of assistance forever, the senior official added, arguing the current rate of support could be sustained for a year or possibly two, but not more. And now the members of the military say Ukraine is a total lost cause. So national security experts have penned an open letter to the New York Times, an open letter calling for a swift diplomatic end to the war in Ukraine was published in Tuesday's New York Times. The letter has 14 signatories that mostly former U.S. military officers and other national security officers, including Jack Matlock, 
former ambassador to the Soviet Union, Ann Wright, retired U.S. Army colonel, former diplomat, Matt Ho, former Marine Corps officer, State Department officials, retired colonel who served as State uh, Colin Powell's chief of staff. The list is long. Many are longtime critics of U.S. foreign policy, post-9-11 war policies. The letter calls for an un- calls the war in Ukraine on the part of the United States and NATO an unmitigated disaster and cautions that future devastation could be exponentially greater as nuclear powers creep ever closer to toward open war, they say. And they say the expansion of NATO is directly to blame. That they thought, well, expanding NATO to Putin's doorstep? What did you think was going to happen? This. Uh, the letter entitled, The U.S. Should Be a Force for Peace in the World. That was what they named this letter. It's almost laughable, like anyone in Washington really wants to do that. They're urging the Biden administration to pivot hard right now towards pursuing a negotiated peace agreement and to end this war quickly. They say this reality is not entirely of our own making, yet it may well be our undoing, the letter concludes, unless we dedicate ourselves to forging a diplomatic settlement that stops the killing and diffuses tension, they say. Hallelujah. Like We are vehemently anti-war on this show. Hopefully they'll pay attention to this letter Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe they'll be receptive to it. Well, I'm not holding my breath because Biden is on his way to the G7 summit in Japan and he's going to uh, be meeting with other Western leaders. And surely the rhetoric about Russian sanctions will get louder over the next few days. Um, You know, it, it would be wonderful if that would happen. Yeah. But we shouldn't hold our breath for it. Want everyone to subscribe to the show. If you're new here, please subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. Also, smash that like button. It really helps us push further out into the YouTube algorithm because they try to suppress our show. They block us. They ban us. Um, And so they shadow ban content like this. And they do not want the truth to get out there. We see it with all the time. We see it with all the time. But if you actually smash that like button during a live show, it actually pushes us out so more people can see the show right now. So please do that, whether you're on uh, whether you're on uh, YouTube or even Rumble as well. Uh, it helps there as well. All right, let's talk about the Twitter files, shall we? Because the mainstream media is totally ignoring the new round of Twitter files that just dropped last night. Uh, yes, we're going to talk about whether or not certain ac- reporters had access to Twitter, whether they were giving privilege to certain journalists and, um, you know, the opposite to others. So let's go through it. The latest round just released from journalist Paul Thacker. Are you going to just yeah, go, we'll go through, through it? it yeah, we your... have his first tweet here. And, okay. it, you know, he said new internal Twitter files help explain why privileged reporters hate Elon Musk and Twitter 2.0. So privileged reporters that had access to. Backdoor access with Twitter, basically. Um, And who were assuming have it no longer. Yes, have it no longer. So let's kind of go through these here. You want to take these? So, all right, number two, he says, so during my trip to Twitter's HQ in San Francisco, I uncovered several documents that explain why reporters now hate Twitter 2.0. Musk fired their friends and cut off their privileged access. So what was this privileged access? Well, they say for years, Twitter provided favored access to disinformation reporters, giving them access to new products and silencing accounts. Musk ended this access and brought in new reporters to go through the company's documents, something no CEO has ever done before. So what they're saying is that certain uh, we want to call them media darling Uh, Twitter users were being given access to decide what to mark as disinformation based on what the mainstream media had already decided and who to weaponize. We've already seen this from Pfizer executives, uh, them saying, I don't like this person saying this. It's promoting vaccine skepticism. Um, I don't like them to talk about this. Let's shut down a conversation about this. Uh, It turns out that media was also given that access. Here's what he says. Number five, when Twitter rolled out Birdwatch to label misinformation, they gave NBC News Ben Collins a demo and exclusive access. And Collins was actually part of the features product development. Um, Do you want the emails? No, we don't need to go through that. But but Ben, it's just we should point out. So NBC News, a journalist at NBC News gets access to this from Twitter gets access this bird watch label of misinformation like calling corporate media to check in with NBC News like get get on the phone with Jake Tapper too like these are going to be our trusted sources for uh, banning accounts under this bird watch program 
Um, they even used him. They say number six. He was really loved inside Twitter. Ben Collins. Yes. Even suggesting him to moderate one of their panels. And when they met with reporters in New York City, he admitted that Twitter helped propel his professional profile and helped him get on NPR and other TV outlets. So they pushed his profile. So Twitter then like quid, quo, quid pro quo, like, hey, you're scratching our back. We'll promote your profile. So it pops up in search results and it's more prominent and more people will see it. Right. So number seven, he says, Musk has now unveiled community notes. This is the funny part, which now allows more users to comment than Birdwatch did. This hasn't worked out for fact checkers like Glenn. I love this story from Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post. So Glenn had put out a piece called New Fact Check Piece from the Washington Post. The incredibly, the, the incendiary claim that George Soros funds Alvin Bragg. Like, he, so he did a fact check piece about this, like what he called was like fake news that George Soros never funded Alvin Bragg at all. Well, turns out, thanks to the community posts, Soros did fund Alvin Bragg, donated a million dollars to the largest donation it received. So I love like, it, this is amazing. So Musk now unveiled community notes, which allows more users to comment than birdwatch. This hasn't worked out for fact checkers like G Glenn uh, Kessler at the Washington Post. Who, foam, who was a fact checker on his own. That right. must feel very meta. Like my job is fact checking, but all of my facts that I'm, ch uh, all of my checks that are fact, facts that are checked are wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Only the facts I like shall be checked in a way that I like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, number eight, reporters apparently also helped Twitter by flipping their bills under consideration. Yeah, so their Congress has bills that they're like considering and they're literally fun giving them out to uh, D.C. reporters through Twitter. Reporters basically helping Twitter get these bills. Well, under reporters acting as lobbyists. Yeah. That is is unconscionable. So you're a reporter for CNN or you're a reporter for the Washington Post or in this case, Ben Collins, NBC News, and Twitter is coming to you to act as like a liaison between Congress and Twitter to like help them in whatever kind of... Who needs a lobbyist when the reporters are willing to do your bidding? <laughs> Number nine, Twitter dealt with bills to moderate them for suspending conservatives by ducking behind trade associations to do the heavy lifting as, in, as engaging or commenting would give them more attention. Twitter met with New York City reporters to solidify key relationships, encourage intel sharing, reinforce communication network of trusted reporters. Like, now that in and of itself is not so unusual. We were reporters in New York City and all kinds of tech companies would want to sort of garner favor and invite you out for a coffee and that kind of stuff. So, um, but it's about what is being shared and then who is being included or not included. Yeah. Reinforce their, well, their network of trusted reporters that they called. Right. Um, one trusted reporter was McKenna Kelly of Vox. She'll be reporting, uh, reporting out of a deep red state. Will dis, will miss disinformation resonate? This implied Twitter and McKenna knew the disinformation paradigm doesn't translate outside the liberal talking circle. Um, and then Kelly showed no interest in Democratic Party misinformation. Looking into Republican Party hype house on TikTok, she said. So this is what she was studying, but she wouldn't look at Democratic misinformation. So that's Not at all. That's no exactly. Need. Oh, CNN glad handler Brian Stelter. Willing to come to San Francisco whenever to meet one-on-one -on -one with spokespeople, even for introductory conversations. These are their briefing notes inside of Twitter about how basically friendly each reporter is to their platform. These are internal notes that they've made briefing documents of like, who's this guy again? Okay. And is he friendly to our cause? Yes. He's on the list. Very good. Oliver Darcy. Donnie O'Sullivan from CNN, Emily Glazer from Wall Street Journal, Lauren Finer from CNBC. Um, it goes on and on. Uh, let's see. Uh, Fox News uh, producer for Dana Perino is really eager to get us on the show. Dana would be fair and not any more tough than the nicest person to question us in Congress. Where so, are you? Uh, number 16. I'm just going to skip it ahead. Oh, OK. Because, yeah, you, you, you missed that CNN number 14 also asked Twitter to create a read only mode to protect their reporters from harassment, as in, can our reporters disseminate things only and then nobody can comment on it to say crappy things to them or point out where they're wrong or retweet and show that they're wrong, which means we want our reporters to only have final say access to Twitter. 
Uh, no, that's not how you already have that on the air. You shouldn't need that on Twitter. That's unbelievable. Um, yeah, we got the Dana Perino one. Um, Fox News tech reporter Brooke Singman. I think we have a good opportunity to influence this coverage and potentially the reputations of congressional newcomers. Um, that's what the Fox News tech reporter is saying. Um, so you, you can see it's it's conservative networks. It's the big ones. It's CNN. It doesn't really matter as long as it's corporate media. Yeah, they ha it. Independent media gets squashed in this independent media like what we do here at Redacted. We don't you know, like we don't stand a chance. We don't stand a chance up against these guys. Right. Especially if they're asking for special treatment on Twitter and they are ide they are only looking for people who they are ideologically aligned. Were you a covidist? You're in. Right. Yeah. Were you skeptical in any way? You're out. Um, you know, we, we can say this for all manner of tenants now, gender ideology, uh, you know, race baiting, all of that stuff. If you're in on that, you're in with us. Um, but if you want to ask inconvenient questions, get the heck out of here. So here's Mick Wall. So that's kind of wraps up the latest tranche of this. They're all sort of looking at like Taylor Lorenz from the Washington Post, because that's a big piece of this. Uh, Tay Tay, as they call her. So Taylor Lorenz kind of tied to this and kind of looking in more on that piece of the, the, the trusted reporters uh, tranche. Um, but Mick Wallace, uh, he had this to say about independent media. And I think it's poignant on a day when we learn about these Twitter files. He said this yesterday. Watch. Independent media is almost non-existent in Europe today. How can we claim to have a functioning democracy if we don't have an independent media? We have a mainstream media that protects the status quo, that protects vested interests, morning, noon, and night. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you're seeing this in these Twitter files. That's exactly what we just saw. So that's the latest tranche of Twitter files. They're still going through them. They're still adding more to this. And I hope we hear more about this uh, uh, from the Washington Post and these big, you know, the the the, the papers of record. Mm -hmm. That's what I love hearing. It's like the Washington Post, the New York Times, which we're supposed to hold up as these bastions of democracy, right? No, that have absolutely told us how to think yeah. and, and what they want us to think and what we're not supposed to question. And then they label people, you know, conspiracy theorists or anti-vaxxers or what have you to, based on any kind of wrong think. And they have help from social media to do that. Uh, we're going to speak to Michael Yan um, down at the border in Yuma, Arizona. He spent the whole night at the border. Um, I caught up to him a short time ago before he was uh, going to sleep, like um, like almost like near lunchtime or, or morning in Arizona time, um, right after he got back from the border. You won't believe what he caught on camera last night. And he says the worst is yet to come. And by the way, schools in New York City are already getting ready. They're putting beds in their gymnasiums. Uh, about eight different schools now have transformed their gymnasiums to put uh, cots in their gymnasiums uh, for, for illegal migrants that are coming across the border. The invasion is real. And he said it's about to get much, much worse in the next few weeks. So we're going to talk to Michael. We're also going to talk about this trans hospital story. Like, is your local hospital staff getting trained on transgender etiquette? And if they fail the etiquette, uh, etiquette training, then they'll get a low grade and therefore they won't get additional funding, basically. Right? No. Well, yes, yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second. All right. So for that story, we're going to have to move over. Let's move over to Rumble now, shall we? We're going to uh, have to say goodbye here because there's some things we're going to talk about, which will get us banned and blocked on uh, on the YouTube platform. As you know, they like to do that. They like to suppress us. So we are going to go over to right there on the screen. That's where we're going. We'd love for you to do whatever you want to do. If you want to watch the rest of the stream, you want to see Michael Yan's report from the border. If you want to see this, uh, this unbelievable story um, on these hospitals, come on over and join us right now on Rumble. That's where we're going to be. Rumble.com slash redacted is where we're going. So thank you on YouTube. Much love to all of you guys. We'll be back.